Arsene Wenger took the reins at Arsenal on the 1st of October 1996. At the time unknown on these shores, the unheralded Frenchman went on to spearhead a revolution in the English game. Over the last two decades, he's experienced glittering success alongside periods of frustration as the club and the game itself has evolved around him. To mark the anniversary of his appointment, we've assembled a panel of experts to assess and dissect his legacy. Ian Wright is an Arsenal legend, scoring 185 goals in 288 games and winning the double under Wenger in 1998. Martin Keown was a gunner stalwart who picked up three Premier League titles and three FA Cups in two spells with the club. Amy Lawrence fell in love with Arsenal at the age of six and is now deputy football correspondent at The Observer and author of two books about the club. Former striker John Hartson was signed by George Graham as the most expensive teenager in English football and experienced the impact of Wenger's arrival firsthand. And broadcaster and journalist Piers Morgan is a lifelong Arsenal fan and in recent times a vociferous critic of Wenger's regime. The table is set. On the menu, the Wenger years. My main ambition is of course to bring success to the team and to satisfy all the people who love Arsenal. Well today it was all about Arsenal. The championship. To come to England for me and uh, to win the championship is a tremendous honour. Maybe it's my biggest satisfaction in my career until now. Arsene Wenger, no question about it, the manager of the season. Soaring, soaring, Arsenal. Destroy! Go! I had a lot of critics when I arrived because I was unknown. Invincible, Arsenal, the champions. I think uh, the Arsenal people had confidence in me. Let's go back to the very beginning, and it's easy to forget the landscape of Premier League football managers was very different. There, there wasn't this plethora of foreign managers. He was exotic, he was different, there was, there was some suspicion about him as well. You know, who was this guy? What was he about? Tell us what it was like to be in that dressing room and hear his name and then meet him for the first time. It was weird because we never heard of him, obviously. And the, pa and the papers were all Arsene who. And when you saw him, he looked really strange, really tall, skinny guy, massive glasses, ill-fitting suit, shirt looked big, everything looked weird, didn't look like a, a football man at all when I first saw him. So I, 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 I did up and down him. Of course, <laughs> you have to, I have to up and down him. <laughs> but like, um, obviously, after that, you just started to realise what he was all about once he opened his mouth. My memories of Arsene Wenger was he was, he was a real child. I'd never heard him swear. Obviously, the boys are there a, a bit longer than I was. and never um, was his voice, really. He didn't really, would never. No, Remember yeah. the first time when Blackburn, when he came in, never spoke for 10 minutes? Yeah, that was a bit That weird. was absolutely the most yeah. strange. That was at half time, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, because most managers, they're coming in, they love the sound of their own voice. There's mm -hmm. always this speech, and he would just wanted calm. He allowed us, he was very clever, he let us sort of sort it police out. it the first yeah. couple of minutes, and then he would have a calm effect. He'd yeah. pick out something that he felt could change the game. It was generally about us starting to play, and once we play, they can't, they can't live with us, and that would yeah. mostly happen. The thing I remember most, every time in the first few weeks that he went to an Arsene Wenger press conference, I came away thinking, I've really learned something mm. today. Like, he was saying things about football I'd never really heard before, anybody else saying, which seems a bit pretentious maybe now, but it was really it had a powerful effect. I think he felt very, very different from the very first impression. Well, it, for, I think for most fans, I was editor of the Mirror at the time, I remember my sports editor coming to me saying, do you want the good news or the bad news? Good news, Bruce Rio was going. And so even though he brought Dennis Bergkamp, this was good news. He wanted to get rid of him. I said, what's the bad news? He went, you're hiring some bloke no one's ever heard of who's been managing in Japan called Arsene Benga. I went, who the hell's he? And I remember thinking, this is just so odd, it's so random. David Dean spotted in Wenger the future of British football. And it was an unbelievably brilliant appointment. Tell us just how alien some of, some of his ideas were at the time. It mm. literally went from Friday we were doing everything we was doing before, like normal, eating whatever you want, to, to Monday. It literally... Yeah. Was well, the canteen was shut, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. George didn't want us in the canteen. Yeah. So it was most extreme. OK, Bria Sriot came in and yeah. changed that slightly. What do you mean the, the canteen was shut? Well, George was like, we're not going to pay for you to have food on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> get, get yourself home. Yeah. You get home. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't even allowed in the canteen before training. No. And this changed. I mean, when we, the training ground, you remember when Arsene came in and they showed him London Colney and the, the lovely green fields, yeah. he said, what is this? There's no facilities here. Yeah. <clears throat> we cannot train here. 
And then... Uh, Are you going to do impressions the whole week? Actually, <laughs> actually, actually the, uh, the kit man rang me and said, we're not going to be at London Colney uh, Monday morning because the training ground's burnt down. And I... And, I, and he said it was arson. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you kidding me? Because I knew the gaffer just didn't like the training ground. But we went to Softball House. We were treated like kings, weren't yeah. we, all of a sudden? Yeah. And it really did change massively. I tablets. remember going in the players' lounge and they were all standing around. Like they'd literally, like there'd been a death in the band. I said, what's going on? I think maybe into you. And he went, he's shut the bar. There's no more alcohol in the players' yeah, lounge. Tony, Tony, Adam, Tony, Tony Adams had a lot to do with that. Tony Adams, yeah. Tony Adams done that. You know, everyone else just let Tony get on with doing what he's doing as long as he was playing. And Wenger came in and, and literally helped him. Mm. So, you know, I speak to Tony, Tony would say he saved his life. Yeah. You know, listened to him and really helped him. After training, normally it would be the quickest in, quickest out, and it was a, it was a big drinking culture at the club. There was a, there was a crowd of seven or eight of the lads that would call it a liquid lunch, and we, we would just have, a, have, a, have lunch as quick as you could. But when Arsene Wenger came in, he would take us to, um, we'd all Aldi, Tone, Nige. Arsene Wenger put three or four years on their careers. Mm -hmm. Everyone seems to give us the impression that what Arsene did differently is treat you like adults. Suddenly, everything was explained to you properly. If you're going to take these vitamin tablets, this is the effect it's going to have. Yeah. If you're going to drink, this is what it will do to you. Yeah. If you're going to stretch, this is how it's going to affect you on a match day. Let me, let me throw a, a slight spanner in the miracle work here. <laughs> is that I, I think it's, it's undeniable that Wenger revolutionised the way that British football was conducted at the sharp end in terms of all the science and the doctors and so on and the diet and no alcohol or whatever. I do think that people overlook how many very good footballers Arsene Wenger inherited. Dennis Burkamp, Martin Keogh, Ian Wright, David Seaman, Tony Adams, uh, Stevie Bold, Lee Dixon, Nigel Winterburn, you know, Patrick Vieira. Mm. These are all very, very good footballers. I think of all those, only Vieira was one that Wenger had any part in, in bringing in. Now, I'm not in any way diminishing the Wenger magic. It feels like you are. Him, no, no, I'm just putting it into historical perspective because I think a lot of the problems he's been having in later years mm. are actually because he hasn't had good enough players. Yes, he inherited a fantastic group of players who were amazing in that double season, but he also brought Vieira, which was mm -hmm. completely down to him. Emmanuel Petit, who was a left-back, who came in and made an amazing partnership. Mark Overmars, mm -hmm. who took the Premier League by storm that year. Nicolas Anelka, who came through and was yeah, a yeah. superb yeah. Uh, Players player. would go on and win a these, World Cup the season later. You know. Would Possibly. that double have happened without the new players no, no, coming I, I, in, I, I, welding together with the old? But do not, but do not underestimate the, the sheer volume of very good players that he okay. had on the books. And we move on to the Invincibles yeah. period. Um, the pinnacle, some might say, of, of his, his 20 yeah. years. And that, that is a very special period of, of football that Arsenal had right there, Ian. When you saw how good the Invincibles were, and they, they'd go for a period of time, I'd watch them for like 10, 15 minutes of a football match. It could be, it could be nil, nil, and then in the space of 10, it's, it's four nil. It, and it's just scintillating football from back to front, amazing. What I remember most was when Wenger won the league at White Hart Lane. I was in the Spurs boardroom with Lord Sugar. And afterwards, everyone had gone. Lord Sugar did a runner from the boardroom. And in walked Arsene Wenger and Pat Rice. And I remember thinking, I will never love any man as much as I love this guy <laughs> right now. You are the most extraordinary thing to have happened to Arsenal Football yeah. Club. He always said it was his life dream, and I think what that going a season unbeaten. Nobody, it wasn't a, it wasn't an ambition that people had in mm. football. Going a season unbeaten wasn't what you went for. You wanted to win the league. Yeah. You maybe wanted to be top scorer. He did mention it. Or he did mention it the season, the season before, before. Absolutely. The season, and, uh, we felt that uh, that gave us a little bit, created a lot of pressure because everybody suddenly was targeting us. And then the year that we actually did do it, it, it went under the radar. 
but I think it was an idea that Wenger definitely developed the year before. It was something that he wanted to achieve. But he thought it was possible when nobody else even thought it was something worth chasing. Yeah, and and probably, it's, it's because he's a perfectionist. Well, he probably looked at the dressing room as well. Well, he probably mm. realised the players that he had in there. He had characters, he had pace, he had players with incredible flair, he had defenders that wanted to defend, he had a world-class goalkeeper. So he probably looked at that team and thought, Do you know what, for the first time in my management career, I actually think this team is good enough to go a season. Perfect. And but there were players it. that were refusing to be beaten. Mm. Thierry Henry came into the club, you know, he was a bit of a shy teenager, he was lacking in confidence, and what he grew into, into that period, was almost unplayable. And he, on his own, would get you back into games. But never mind that, you had such quality all around him. And I think Patrick Vieira as well was a massive driving force in all the success there were a the lot of leaders in that team though. a lot of strong characters and remember gabby also who we were beating in that era you know wenger won the league three times in that eight-year period against fantastic manchester united teams he revolutionized everything and he was unbelievably successful and yet the the problem now i think for all those who loved wenger and fell in love with wenger like me is that it's just not the same okay but i just want to hear one more point from you amy on the press at this time and this marvellous kind of head-to-head -head that we, we used to have in the press conferences with um, Arsene Wenger and Alex Ferguson. Was it a joy to be a journalist in this period covering Arsenal? Well, I think it was a golden era in that you had two heavyweights and we've become used to in more recent seasons the Premier League has been a bit more mixed in terms of who's up there competing and the, the whole top four thing going on. But back then, for about six years, it was Arsenal Man United. It was the North against the South. It was the, a Bain Frenchman against the old fashioned Scott. It was Keane against Vieira. It was a real heavyweight, no holds barred collision course, full pelt. <laughs> and it was totally captivating. In time, they realise that actually they've got more in common than they think. And I think Arsene Wenger and Sir Alex Ferguson quite like and respect one another quite warmly now. What people forget is that you had to build a stadium. To build the stadium, we had to create money. I went with the club for our challenge, it is to build a new stadium without dropping out of the uh, Champions League, and uh, we made it every year. I feel I've done my job in a very committed and faithful way. So conveniently, this 20-year period can be sliced in the middle. It's almost the before and after, and it's ironically one of his great passion projects, the building of the Emirates, the move from Highbury, where things turn. The football landscape changed and the trophies became a bit harder to come by. Speaking completely personally as a fan, I preferred Highbury. I love the intimacy of that stadium. I love the fact the corners were open. You could see the old railway trains. Come on, Piers, you couldn't survive in the modern era no, right, right now with a stadium like I'm that. I'm not sure we have survived in the modern era with our fancy stadium. Uh, I felt we lost our heart. I felt we lost a lot of things in that move. Now, you don't mind if you then actually go and buy the world's best players and you go and win the Premier League and Champions League and maintain the level of performance on the pitch that we had enjoyed before. But actually, the complete opposite happened. And I'm not sure even now that if you ask most Arsenal fans, who would you rather watch, Highbury or the Emirates? Most of them, I tell you, you'd be surprised. would probably say, I prefer watching it at Highbury. You, you, you looked there like you, you were a little bit aggrieved at, at that Well, I, I, I'm in the Arsene Wenger camp. Uh, there's, there's lots that aren't. Last season, there was pockets around the Emirates of uh, fans putting up banners and Wenger out and all this, which... I was quite disgusted by and I, I, I voiced my opinion about that. I said that, that you shouldn't be doing that. A lot of the money has gone into the stadium. Um, I think he's made some mistakes, yes. I, I think he's let players' contracts run down. You look at Nasri, you look at Van Persie. He should have been sacked for that alone. I mean, seriously, you sell your captain and your best player to your number one rivals and they win the league and he wins the golden boot? I mean, are we kidding each yeah, other? No, do you think he's still the same ruthless winner yeah, he was before? He Alex play. Ferguson he rang wanted. Arsene Wenger himself. Yeah. He did the deal on the phone to Wenger. He said to him, 24 million for Van Persie. OK, you take my is. captain, you take my best none striker. None an absolute happy. dereliction of duty none by none an Arsenal manager. Nope. But Pierce, the bottom line is right? here. But the bottom line is here. 
It's not been good enough in terms of trophies won, but it's been more than acceptable to the owners the because, because, I agree with because of the money I that he's making for the I club agree. and the owner. I remember, when, I, I remember when, Thierry, when Thierry left and then he went on to Barcelona to win the Champions League, that's, li that's literally saying to, to the players there that you're not going to win the Champions League here. Right, that, that made me feel quite sad that that, that that had to happen. Then for Robin Van Persie to go to Man United and score all the goals like he did and they literally won the, the bloody league with, with his goals. Without doubt, if he hadn't gone there, they wouldn't have won it. I don't think they would have. And, you know, Man United fans would say, no, no he would have. But I don't think they would have. And yeah. I think that somewhere along the line, Arsene Wenger got really soft on that. This is the problem now. There's a generation of Arsenal fans who've never tasted the success of being champions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking at 12 years, and that is that there's a growing unrest from the younger fan. The older fan has been brought up on this brand of football, the Arsenal way, that beautiful football, and they're respectful to Arsenal. This is where I'm talking about. You, you're Pierce, apparently a younger fan. Pierce, yeah, you do not him. talk with any real respect for, for Arsene Wenger. He, That's not he, true. I've never no, done a great thing personally. It, and while he's in tenure, while he's there, he decides, I'm afraid, not you. He decides, Why does he decide? He decides what he does. Why does help Because he has that? earned the right to do that with the success he had on the pitch. But how many years? And how he has managed the club. What if he wants since, to carry on for 10 since, more and years? And who's to say he's not right to have done what he did with all that money okay. been spent by other clubs? Right, look, and, give me a number. How many more years, if it's left to Wenger to decide, and he carries on not winning the league and not even reaching a Champions League final, at what point do you guys, and I understand why you love Wenger, I loved Wenger too, but as a manager, how many more years do you now well, give him? Well, this is what he has to do now. Before he, no, before he gets sacked, I'm not he giving won't go. Him. I would give him another three years simply what? because, simply because, he's I think that, he's, I he's, think that he's, he's, put, he's put a lot of faith into a lot of squads that have let him down, just miserable, they've let him down so three badly. Three more years, right? and, and what so, happens if we come third or fourth uh, and well, that's what, bomb that's, down the Champions League? Okay. We won't do that. Should Arsene Wenger, should he sign a new contract? And, and yes, OK, he may be offered one, but should he now not say, my time is up, and make that decision himself? Because from what you've all said, he's going to be the one that's actually in control of that decision. It's the same as it's ever been. Every time a contract renewal comes about, and there's been many over 20 years, and there may be many more, uh, the only person who makes that judgment call looks in the mirror, and it's Arsene Wenger. Why? Because he Why wants to look at himself... Why is he the only employee in the world who decides his own contract? Look, he is the last of his kind. Whatever way you look at it, he's the last emperor in football. You ask Alex Ferguson or Jose Mourinho <clears throat> or the Arsene Wenger of 2000 or 97 or 2004, how do you fancy coming third and fourth for 12 years and they'd have laughed at you? I think going forward, 12 years without the title, yeah? I think this season there's a real feel-good factor around the Emirates and Arsenal. He's added, added well in Lucas, Jacka, and Mustafi. I think in terms of a new contract, he's got a really challenge this season. Nicely done, brilliantly done, Bayern in, Walcott! Sensational Arsenal goal! It's Sanchez, could go back to Ozil, it does! It's three! It is the stuff of Arsenal dreams. Let's just talk in slightly more considered terms about yeah. his legacy. If he was to go at the end of this season. Yeah. When you think of the, f the, legacy. Like with the legacy, right? I always curse the fact I didn't have more time with him. Mm -hmm. I'd love to have been in and around the Invincibles mm -hmm. and everything else what's happened with Arsenal. And it does hurt me, to, it hurts me to the core to see us not really challenging for the last, the last years. But I'm not going to sit here and not defend him because of mm -hmm. how great I believe he is and what he will be remembered for. And this is what I say with Arsenal fans, be careful how disrespectful you are being to him because once he is gone you will realize as much as it's been barren apart from the FA Cups the last 10 years he has taken our club global and the way people think of Arsenal Football Club we weren't too far away Martin you would probably play when they were singing boring boring Arsenal I like to think I came in and kind of helped that a little bit but the fact is Mark they were still singing that when we were playing just before Wenger got there it does seem to be a story in two acts. Mm -hmm. The first act, he was a revolutionary. He brought amazing things to English football and to Arsenal. The second act has been a bigger picture act. There's another kind of success. And I know that by his very high standards that he set in the first half of his career, the second half doesn't look successful by most his own people's standards, as well. standards and his own. But in terms of what he has done to the football club, mm -hmm. 
um, I think there's a lot to admire in what's been a, a complex second half of his career. You know, we were there when Arsene Wenger arrived at the football club. We thought Arsenal was big. It wasn't big at all. You see how big it is now around the world. You see Arsene Wenger, as big as he is. And whoever comes in next, that is the joy for the next manager, whoever comes in, because what he's created, the platform he has now created, if we'd have stayed at Highbury Pierce mm -hmm. as you wanted to, mm -hmm. we would never be able to survive or never have a, to have a future. He's securing the future. But in doing so, I think he's taken away a little bit of some of the trophies he might well have won himself. He Absolutely. could have been a little bit greedier, yeah. but every decision that he has made has been for the benefit of Arsenal Football Club. When you hear the respect that these guys have for Wenger, long, long, long after they played for him, that in the end is an amazing legacy. The, the, the love and devotion that so many great players have for Wenger, I think, is a testament to the style of football that he's always tried to play. And that is an amazing legacy on its own. I don't think um, it's my gut that we won't be here in 10 years or 20 years' time still talking about Arsene Wenger, but who knows? Um, oh, so I wouldn't put it past him. <laughs> <laughs> Eight million a year, I'd string it out. Right. Well, he'll have to win I'll be here until I was 90. Guys, I, I hope you can still be friends after this. Of course! <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it! I love this! This is quite tame by a normal no, chat. No, I love it. I'm going to leave you guys to chat on a bit about Arsene Wenger's legacy some more, but let's take you back. Arsene Wenger took the reins at Arsenal on the 1st of October 1996. At the time unknown on these shores, the unheralded Frenchman went on to spearhead a revolution in the English game. Over the last two decades, he'd experienced glittering success alongside periods of frustration as the club and the game itself has evolved around him. To mark the anniversary of his appointment, we've assembled a panel of experts to assess and dissect his legacy. Ian Wright is an Arsenal legend, scoring 185 goals in 288 games and winning the double under Wenger in 1998. Martin Keown was a gunner stalwart who picked up three Premier League titles and three FA Cups in two spells with the club. Amy Lo he was exotic, he was different, there was, there was some suspicion about him as well. You know, who was this guy? What was he about? Tell us what it was like to be in that dressing room and hear his name and then meet him for the first time. It's weird because you never heard of him, obviously. And the, and the papers were all Arsene who. And when you saw him, he looked really strange. Really tall, skinny guy, massive glasses, ill-fitting suit, shirt looked big, everything looked weird. Didn't look like a, a football man at all when I first saw him. So I, 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 I did up and down him. Of course, you have to, I have to up and down him. <laughs> but like, um, obviously, after that, you just started to realise what he was all about once he opened his mouth. My memories of Arsene Wenger was he was, he was a real child. I'd never heard him swear. Obviously, the boys are there a, a bit longer than I. Lawrence fell in love with Arsenal at the age of six and is now deputy football correspondent at The Observer and author of two books about the club. Former striker John Hartson was signed by George Graham as the most expensive teenager in English football and experienced the impact of Wenger's arrival firsthand. And broadcaster and journalist Piers Morgan is a lifelong Arsenal fan and in recent times a vociferous critic of Wenger's regime. The table is set. On the menu, the Wenger years. My main ambition is, of course, to bring success to the team and to satisfy all the people who love Arsenal. Well, today, it was all about Arsenal. Tony Adams! Oh, what a way to clinch the championship! To come to England for me and uh, to win the championship is a tremendous honour. Maybe it's my biggest satisfaction in my career until now. Arsene Wenger, no question about it, the manager of the season. Soaring, soaring, Arsenal. I had a lot of critics when I arrived because I was unknown. Invincible, Arsenal, the champions. I think uh, the Arsenal people had confidence in me. Let's go back to the very beginning and it's easy to forget the landscape of Premier League football managers was very different. There, there wasn't this plethora of foreign managers. It was, and, um, was his voice already, he didn't really, would never. No. Remember the first time when Blackburn, when he came in, never spoke for 10 minutes? Yeah, that was a bit That weird. was absolutely the most yeah. strange. That was at half time, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, because most managers that are coming in, they love the sound of their own voice. There's mm -hmm. always this speech and he was just wanted calm. He allowed us. He was very clever. He let us sort of sort it police out. it the first mm. couple of minutes, and then he would have a calm effect. Yeah. He'd pick out something that he felt could change the game. It was generally about us starting to play, and once we play, they can't they can't live with us, and that would yeah. mostly happen. The thing I remember most every time in the first few weeks that he went to an Arsene Wenger press conference, I came away thinking, I've really learned something mm. today. Like he was saying things.